Welcome. It's nice to see you all. Hello, I'm Andrew Taylor. I'm in the Faculty of the Arts Management Program here at American University, and we're going to have a conversation about artistic leadership, particularly the search and support for new artistic leadership in American nonprofit theater. Um, and as we begin all things, I want to make sure we acknowledge, I'm going to do this myself because it's right here, um, that we are located on the territories of the Piscataway, Powhatan, and Nanticoke peoples. And as organizers of this event, we recognize our ability to gather here is due to the continued occupation of this land. We also recognize many enslaved and indentured people were forced to dedicate their labor to the construction of what is now Washington, DC. To these people and their descendants, we acknowledge their indelible mark on the space in which we will gather for this event. And lastly, in recognition that this land is colonized indigenous territory that has been crafted through slave and indentured labor, it's our collective responsibility here and always to critically interrogate the histories and afterlives of these events and to honor, protect, and sustain this land. Um, and I hope the conversation today is in part living um, some of the promises we make by saying that out loud, because if you don't actually do anything, um, you might as well not say it. So we're gonna try our best to live the values we're putting here. Um, so for those joining us on, online, welcome on HowlRound, on Zoom, wherever you happen to be. Uh, for those in the room, welcome. I'm really excited to have these extraordinary professionals in the room with us. Um, and I think I'm just gonna start with having you each um, just say a little bit about what your job is. Like if you had to explain artistic director of a theater to somebody who didn't know what an artistic director of a theater did, I would love for each of you to give that lens. And then you as well. Let's start with Hannah Sharif, who's joining us from Arena Stage. Hi. Hey. <laughs> that was a lot of talking. How's everybody feeling tonight? Uh, uh, call and response. Warm the room up a little bit. Um, so I, I'm artistic director at Arena Stage, and I think the question is, what does an artistic what is director that? do? Good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I depend. So I will say that there are different models of artistic directors. I have a somewhat traditional artistic practice. I'm both a playwright a director and a producer, right? So I call myself a generative, interpretive, and curatorial artist. And um, as artistic director, I'm the lead artist at the institution. I curate all of the seasons. So I choose all of the, the plays that one sees. I hire all of the teams. And what I'd say is that artistic director, and I'm also uh, very hands-on in the running of the company, which again, there are different models and across generations, some artistic directors were less involved in the, the, the actual running of the theater or the, the model that supports the work. But for me, I don't know how to do this work without understanding the kind of uh, fiscal reality of the organization and how all of the threads of what we do come together. Um, artistic directors also are often lead fundraisers for the institution. I spend a lot of time raising money for the art and for the artists. Um, I am responsible for actualizing the mission and um, uh, creating the blueprint for the vision of the organization. It is an incredibly important job. All of the threads of the organization, I always say that in, in, in a theater, you do one of two things. You're either in the business of making theater or selling theater. Uh, and what kind of theater, how you do that work, how you serve your community is through the vision of the artistic director. So um, it is an incredibly important job. Um, and in the American theater, uniquely compared to the museum world or the symphony world or the opera world, most of our nonprofit regional theaters have a, um, a two-person executive leadership team of equals. And that is different. If you go into the symphony world, there's usually an executive director that's kind of final say. Uh, but in, in the traditional nonprofit theater, you often see an artistic director and a managing director. And the managing director has fiscal responsibility to support the vision of the artistic director. Um, and you work very closely uh, hand in hand. And um, when it's a great marriage, it, it means that wonderful things happen for your institution. Um, and when it is not, it means you have to work really hard to make it a great marriage so that wonderful things happen for your institution. And it's beautiful. So that's, you can see how hard it is to find and secure extraordinary leadership that does all that. And maybe I'm going to pivot to Reg before I go to you because we want to see oh, if God. Reginald Douglas, who's here from Mosaic Theater, is uh, also artistic director. Um, I would say disagree. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> what Hannah says. And, you know, I think just a, a yes and to everything Hannah says about the marriage, about the partnership. 
um, about being the one who both has the vision and helps implement it or leads it. I think for Mosaic, we're uniquely and purposely, where I say we're intentionally leaning into our biggest of uh, the small and smallest of the big uh, uh, unique opportunity here in Washington, D.C., where there's a robust theater and cultural scene. Um, Mosaic, we're thinking deeply, particularly as we head into our 10th anniversary next year, um, the third under my leadership, about how do we actualize our resources to the best of our ability to serve artists and audience as well as our staff. Um, I sometimes find that uh, the, the three of those uh, constituents can fall out of whack a bit. And we've worked really intentionally to build the right team structure to then support the artists, help us then grow the audience to be reflective of what we are and what even more so we could be. Very cool. And Al Hartley, who's here from Atlanta, um, uh, does many things, management consulting included, but I wanted to, his role, at least today, is focusing on the search consultant portion of his job. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about what a search consultant does in support of um, executive or artistic leadership? Absolutely. You know, I feel like you all can maybe tell me what a search consultant does <laughs> more than I can, uh, but only because really I, I tripped into this work. Um, so my name is Al Hartley. I'm a partner and a co-founder at a firm called Evolution Management Consultants, um, where we really center um, equity, diversity, inclusion, and access within our work, authenticity within our work um, to, to do both search and uh, management and planning for theater and nonprofit organizations. Uh, but specifically with search, especially how um, both Hannah and Reginald have dis, uh, described the artistic director role. So much of my journey um, is working to find folks uh, within the field uh, who want to occupy these positions of artistic director or executive director. So usually whenever someone like Ahana leaves or like Reginald leaves their post of an executive leadership position, often boards will hire or will form a search committee that is tasked with finding the next artistic leader or the next executive leader. Um, and in order to do that and facilitate that process, some search committees choose to do it completely on their own uh, in terms of actually putting out a job description, finding candidates and interviewing them, ultimately making a recommendation to the board for who to hire. Um, rather than some organizations doing that themselves, they choose to hire a search consultant to say, you know, you're really the party and so, and so to speak, the expert in terms of this role in finding who are the players or who are the people that are interested in this kind of job, identifying the skill sets and the needs within the organization around leadership and what is needed out of a leader. Uh, and then being able to design what I less call a search, but a journey. I, I think that each, uh, in, in my own artistic way, each leadership search is a kind of journey for a question that an organization is asking itself in this moment. Um, so my job is to design that journey. What are the questions that are obvious to think about? And then, frankly, what are the questions that are not being asked and thought about? And how do you put that at the forefront? Beautiful. So, okay. So we have um, someone who tends to represent the, the sort of board or the search committee. And then we have two people, one very recently in their new position, one uh, been there for a little bit. Um, and that's our exploration today is thinking about, well, how does this process either facilitate or, or not facilitate the availability of these leadership roles for a diverse set of voices and perspectives? Because um, if you look over the history of professional nonprofit theater, you don't see a lot of um, diversity at the top level, um, and we're just starting to see that now. So I love the idea of a journey. I was going to frame it in a little bit more, uh, maybe awkward way, because I'm not as elegant. Um, is sort of um, is essentially the four steps of a problem solving. Like mm. let's say your artistic director is leaving or has left. You as a governing board are responsible for the health and vitality of the organization. You have a problem, right? And maybe it's opportunity. So we'll, we'll, it's not always a problem. You guys are not solving a problem, but uh, let's frame it that way, just so we can use sort of the problem-solving steps um, and think about each of them. And I'm trying and pace ourselves to see if we can make it through. But essentially, first you have to define the problem you have and formulate what exactly it is you're facing. So we'll think of that in the search as about well, what does the job description look like? What is the kind of the, the ways we're thinking about? What does our next leader leader need to know or do or have capacity to do? Who are we, and how can our leader reflect and amplify that? Uh, the second is you have to generate alternatives, right? So we've now we've shaped a job search idea. 
we have to find candidates in the world. Um, how do we look? How do we draw a circle that includes people that might not have otherwise shown up in traditional or conventional lists? The third is the decision making, right? So now we've got it down to a short list. We need to actually talk to these people, make a decision about which of these candidates that are our finalists are the ones that fit and how, how are they going to know us? And finally, we have to implement um, and adapt. And so let's make the choice. We've hired somebody. They've agreed to join us. They're now in the organization. Um, now we have to see what happened. Um, and each of those, to me, that translates also into the onboarding and support of a new artistic leader and the way they either are able to manifest the change that everybody talked about during the process, or they are not able to manifest the change because the organization wasn't actually ready to change. Um, so that's the way I want to talk about this, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And again, you're not it's not problem and solution, but I find it's a, a frame. So let's think about first, and again, from the search consultants and from your own experience in the search process, the problem formulation. So um, how good are nonprofit professional theater boards at describing what they need mm. uh, in artistic leadership? Is that I something that's it, good? It does. I just have my spirits on. I, I think problem is not a useful noun here. I think yeah. opportunity is far more useful. Great. Um, because I wouldn't be attracted to, and I don't think many candidates would be attracted to, hi, come fix us. Mm -hmm. Or hi, there's a problem, will you be the savior? Mm -hmm. And you can suss that out pretty quickly, mm -hmm. I think, in a conversation, particularly mm -hmm. when you get deeper into the search process. Mm -hmm. And so I've been drawn to searches and ultimately drawn to the position at Mosaic where there is a spirit of opportunity in the room. Mm -hmm. So yes, there may be some real problems or the opportunity arises because of past problems, but I think, especially on the artistic leadership position, that it's important that that board or that candidate or that staff or that search committee, but that the people, the constituents at play are looking for more than answers to the problems that have existed and are actually excited about what could become from a new leader. Mm -hmm. And I think that spirit of a search is very important. That's great. So yeah. I just want yes. to... I offer accept. that from personal experience <laughs> and as we look people who all right i about fully it. accept the revision now we're talking about opportunity description and formulation and um mm -hmm. and there may also be problems in the mix that need yes. to be engaged but let's lead yes. with opportunity and and new new potential yeah. can i ask like a context before yeah, we please, dive in I, I know this is not the, the starting point, but <laughs> I, I think it's really important um so so part of it is to understand that we are a field in evolution right mm -hmm. and the last uh, five years in particular, I would say five to 10 years, uh, has been, uh, for our field, warp speed evolution. Mm -hmm. So 20 years ago, um, there were basically two search firms that did 95% <laughs> of the searches in the American theater. Mm -hmm. So there were only two firms. So if you, if a job came open 20 to 30 years ago, a theater board would call the two search firms and would get an RFP and figure out which of the two they were going to go with. The other thing about the search experience um, uh, two decades ago, th three decades ago, um, certainly it was this way uh, 20 years ago, I can speak personally to it, <laughs> is that the search firms were also somewhat hidden. So you didn't know mm -hmm. until you were the right pedigree and they came for you, mm -hmm. you didn't know who they were, right? <laughs> so it's a little bit like, this mis there these these mysterious firms, mm -hmm. right? So if you were not at a theater that had done a search and you had not been invited into a search, you didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting because in order for that to stay secret, that meant that everyone in the American theater had to be complicit, right? Mm -hmm. So people who had been invited into the process and had been candidates were also keeping quiet about who the firms were because that's what you were taught was supposed to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So what would happen is, the search firms who were who were meant to be um, the professional keepers of talent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would be the gatekeepers for access to executive leadership jobs, mm -hmm. which meant if you were not on their radar, you were never going to be invited into a process because for the most part, they there also wasn't a public um, mm -hmm. opportunity for you to submit yourself for a job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so... When enough people knew you and you made it to the short list, you would get this magical call from one of the two firms inviting you into the secret process <laughs> of interviewing to become an executive leader. Mm -hmm. I wish this was not the truth. This, this is all true. This is all, this is, yeah. These are yeah, facts, this is right? All things. Um, and I will give you this example. I was at a TCG conference and I was in a, 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 a multi-generational BIPOC leaders room. 
And some of the younger folks were saying, I really want to submit myself for these jobs and I don't know where to go. And some of the older leaders were hush. Mm -hmm. But I was with an organization that was going through a leadership shortage. So I knew who the two firms were. Mm -hmm. And so I said in the room mm -hmm. who the two firms were. And a hush fell over the room. <laughs> I had worked in the card pool, <laughs> revealing to the masses who actually does the searches and saying, I'm going to give email addresses so you can send your resumes in so they will know that you exist. Because the other thing that was happening, and I use this as an example, when I was at Hartford Stage, Michael Wilson was the artistic director. He transitioned out and they, we hired one of the two firms to do the search. I was the associate artistic director at the theater. I'd been at the theater at that point for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I was not invited into the search. Mm -hmm. I was on search committee. <laughs> and when I had a conversation with the leader of the search about why halfway through the process, there had only been one woman who had been brought before the search committee that I was on and no people of color, the search consultant looked at me and said, that's because there are no qualified people of color. Mm -hmm. And this is the, you've got the most qualified woman we could find. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm I'm an associate artist. Half the people you brought in the room are in the position that I'm in. Half of the people in your COVID shops are associate artistic directors. Mm -hmm. I am here, mm -hmm. invisible, mm -hmm. right? So this is 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now there was a breaking open that happened in the last 10 years, and how maybe you mm -hmm. know, in terms of like just getting us up to speed. Yeah, there are there are many more firms, mm -hmm. and there has been a, a, a um, what I would say is a medium level of access. I think most people <laughs> in the past would say it's mm -hmm. radical access mm -hmm. because now most jobs will post who's running their search publicly. You can send your materials in to be considered by a search firm for most searches. And there is a, um, a mandate for most institutions to have a much more diverse pool of candidates. Mm -hmm. And so that has shifted the way we approach this question that mm -hmm. you asked us. Mm -hmm. But I do think the context of understanding in the last 20 years that it was a very secret, very curated process by which only the people who, and most of, not most, both search firms had all male search consultants, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So there were no women running searches. Mm -hmm. There were women working in the company, they were not running searches. There were no people of color in either of those companies. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a surprise that we had this kind of monolithic leadership because they were the gatekeepers to determine who was qualified to be seen for those jobs. Mm -hmm. That has shifted in a profound way, but I just wanted us to have that context for this conversation. And I think, yeah. I think the important piece with, and I love this framing around opportunity and also the context of searches, um, I've been doing search work now for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And when Hannah talks about the mysteriousness of not knowing either who the firms were, um, talk about having to start a firm and then figure out what is this process that we go through? <laughs> you know, what is even the process of doing this? Because it sounds simple, right? You got a job opening, you do a job description, you get <laughs> candidates, you know, you talk about the candidates, you interview them, you know, then you say, hey, you want this job? Yeah, maybe I do. You offer, negotiate, they come in, they're done. You know, <laughs> simple framing, right? You know, you hope that's it. And we're done. That's not it. And, and that, that's not it. You know, you, you come in when, when you ask about do people know what to expect? I, I think my job as a search consultant is to reveal that opportunity and also reveal the organization. I think mm -hmm. now, over the past five years, there's been an expectation of some level of more transparency. Yeah. There's been an expectation of more diverse candidates within your pool so that it doesn't have a monolith. There's literally a, a, a blog uh, or email list about the Game of Thrones of the American theater. Because what got me interested was saying, He's oh, this here. person has moved here, and this person has moved here, and this person's here, and now this search is open, and this person's going here from the artistic director position or the executive director position. So I felt like coming in, it was a job to say, how can I frame for the organization what the opportunity is, what their institutional history means in the context of this search? 
what the kind of art that they are making for their community and the history of that art making and what does that mean for the kind of leader that you're trying to find out. Uh, and I think that kind of framing for organizations to say, I have a lot of institutional and historical knowledge about the regional theater field, but now coming into an organization and saying, tell me about yourself on your own terms. And usually when I'm going into listening to an organization, I'm listening for two things consistency and inconsistency, mm -hmm. alignment and non-alignment. Mm -hmm. Where does the board have alignment about the kind of person that they're looking for? Because I'll tell you, and I'm, I'm sure that Hannah and Reg have gone through this in some ways, you ask people what they want. I want someone who's strategic. I want someone who's operational. I want someone who's an artist. I want someone who can raise money. I want someone who knows how to market to their community. I want someone who knows about EIA. I want someone who knows how to how to coach a staff. I want someone who knows how to expand. I want someone who knows how to grow. I'm like, my goodness, how do I make this word become flesh? And that's what you have to put in front of people and let people know is to say, these are people, these are artists, you know, yes, who they are is really key. And some of the things that you want to bring in are really key, but I am not here searching for unicorns and I'm not here to give you a shiny object. And there's too many people and too many searches over the past past 10 years who have just said, give me a shiny object. Give me a Tony Award winner. Give me someone who's won a Pulitzer Prize. Give me someone who's a, who's a uh, MacArthur Genius Grant person. What does that mean in terms of the organizational direction and the strategy of your organization moving forward? Yeah. That's the question. In front. I think what you've just said is really important because the, if you're talking about the opportunity, the truth is most boards don't know what they're that's, looking that's, for, that's, that's, right? Mm -hmm. So when a leader says I'm retiring or I have another job and I have an opportunity, the impulse of most boards, if they have not selected for the leader to leave, which is most of the time not the way it happens, usually it's a leader retiring or ascending mm -hmm. right. to another position. Right. The board is like, what are we going to do? We need someone just like the person we had, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And part of what I think is so important about the search, and I've been through, I've, I've been through three artistic director transitions as a staff person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I think is so important is that we, your institutions evolve. Mm -hmm. So yes. where you were 20 years ago when you hired your artistic director is not where you are now. Right. And so the idea that you just replicate the person before without taking stock of how the field has evolved, mm -hmm. how your community has evolved, mm -hmm. how the art has evolved, boards don't necessarily know how to frame those things from the beginning. And they really depend on the search firm to help codify where to, it's like an institutional assessment that happens first. Mm -hmm. The first opportunity is assess yeah. the institution, mm -hmm. assess the community. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that, that assessment becomes the building blocks for the job description. Yes, yes. And most boards don't know how to get there without the steady hand mm -hmm. of a search firm, which is mm -hmm. part of why they're so valuable. And I'll say really quickly that one of the ways that we try to center that discussion um, to is figuring out who are the people that have traditionally been centered traditionally, you know, usually predominantly white staff and predominantly white boards. And instead for us saying, how do we create a, an affinity space for BIPOC folks within this institution, both board staff, mm -hmm. artists, and community wise, and actually center that in the, in the conversation mm -hmm. about where is the institution now? So that for me as a search consultant, when I go out there and think about these alternatives or who are the folks, I have that affinity space in the back of my head constantly. And usually, at least what I have found, you will find the truth of an organization in that BIPOC affinity group space. You will know and you will hear from people whether theaters and organizations have kept their commitments to EDIA. You will hear, you know, some of the racism and sexism and homophobia that people have experienced within an institution. It's not to say that there are all problems there, but you get to more of some kernels of truth around what may be some of the issues and challenges that we're asking our BIPOC leaders to enter into or any leader to enter into, you know, and how do I even translate that as a search consultant to candidates? And what does it mean for someone like Reg to say, 
I want to enter this search, given the opportunities and maybe the challenges, or also saying, I actually don't want to enter this search based on the opportunity. I want to go towards a different opportunity. Yeah. And I wonder, Reg, if you have a reflection on your experience um, in conversation with Mosaic, uh, whether you found an organization that had some clarity around what their opportunity looked and, and felt yeah. like, uh, whether that was the beginning of a sketch or sort of how did you feel sort of in conversation with the organization about what was what was there? Yes, we are recording. Um, <laughs> I, I say it's okay. I, I really feel having so many colleagues have been part of the seismic shift, so to speak, over the past 10 years um, in a very unique position. You know, I replaced an artistic director who self-selected out, which is not often the case. Um, and so I didn't, and we're also celebrating season nine right now. We're preparing for mm -hmm. season 10. Mm -hmm. And so met an organization that was younger and therefore more nimble mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. around some of the questions mm -hmm. around history and legacy. Um, identity was wonderfully ready to be reshaped. Um, and I met an organization that, you know, also wasn't doing a pivot towards EDI that the core of Mosaic's mm -hmm. mission and DNA has always been cross-cultural thinking. Um, I think the, so there's just so many factors that from the beginning made the, or, the organization and the opportunity different than others I had been, searches I had gone through, opportunities I had been presented. Um, and I, I never take that for granted. But I met an organization that was really excited about new ideas, new ways of working. Um, if anything, I felt more pressure to be different Mm -hmm. as opposed to pressure to be the same as the predecessors I've had uh, or that the organization may have had. Mm -hmm. Got it. So what, um, if you could design the process, right? So a board and you design the process, but you guys can design now too, uh, where a board is starting to explore the idea of a new artistic director and artistic leadership. What is it they actually need to know or engage with or understand in order to formulate the actual beginning of a conversation with potential artistic um, partners? So what do you need to know as the board um, to make this a positive and productive step? I, I mean, I feel like half of it is um, it's it's that establishing what is happening in the field currently, um, talking about what are some of the ways in which artistic directors are speaking, you know, or the kind of work that is being done out there. You know, Hana, great director, Reg, great director, you know, who's out here in our field trying to give a basis of what is, might that mean if you're looking at candidates like Hana and Reg in terms of the institutional strategy or mission moving forward, the kind of work that they're going to bring to the institution. Um, and half of it, I was saying a little jokingly earlier, but it's really serious. It's, it's actually getting board members to talk about art. It's getting people to talk about the theater that has impacted them, you know, and why it belongs at this institution. Um, and it's also very much understanding, especially for artistic director roles, there are, yes, artistic, um, I would say, competencies or artistic skill sets that are needed within an artistic director. You need to curate, you need to produce, you need to have relationships with artists in some sort of way. You need to have a vision and perspective about community, even defining community within an institutional organization. Really difficult sometimes because your community changes, you know, your cities change. Um, and so there's a lot of basis around what are the artistic imperatives or skill sets that you're looking for? And then what's also needed organizationally as well. Um, you need to fundraise. Yes, you know, that the, the art is the center and sad to say main product of what we're trying to do within a theater organization. So that fundraising ability or that ability to be able to shape and define the art that you're making and being able to discuss and speak to it is really key for a board to understand before meeting candidates. You also have to understand the job or what it means to be an artistic director. I think Hannah and Reg really described it well and succinctly. 
And I, what we try to provide our search committees and boards is to say, read some of these different articles, you know, or read some of this research about how the role of artistic director is changing or has changed. Even the model of it is changing. There are now co-artistic directorship models versus a single artistic director model. You know, so there are questions even for boards and search committees about what's the structure of the organization? Why is this the structure that you need with a co-managing partner or an executive partner? And I think the la the other thing that I would say with a with framing for board and for staff, um, it's almost like what our current president says, like judge me, judge me according to the alternative, not the almighty. You know, you're not looking for the savior. You know, you're not looking for the person that comes from on high and is perfect and gives you every single lovely, wonderful answer. You know, and my job, I feel as a consultant and as a guide, is to give the things that they maybe see on paper or hear out of a candidate, and then also to give some of that organizational perspective, that listening perspective that I try to provide and say, this is another side, hopefully for the candidate's sake to say, here's actually why I have brought this candidate forward and what I'm trying to get you all to have a conversation about or offering about. You know, but I'm curious for you all in particular, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, folks who have looked out at searches or looked at job descriptions, you know, or looked at different organizations, what have you often seen as the frame of what your call is as an artistic director? I think the thing I'd offer the board that I've been most attracted to in previous searches, search at Mosaic, is honesty about who the organization is. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the yes and to looking at what's going on on how around American theater articles, but also what does that actually mean for this company? Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that gets shuffled away or gets overlooked and then comes up from the candidates' questions. You can kind of chisel away to what is the real truth of who we are right now? Mm -hmm operationally, artistically, fundraising, fiscally, where are the savings, where are the reserves? What is the current staff structure? Who is the current audience? Who are we? And as honest and as thorough of an assessment as you can have, I think it's so vital for a board to lead their staff. And I think staff are vital to be a part of that reflective work because there's a real disconnect between the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, mm -hmm. how that then leads to what the artistic director may or may not be responsible for, mm -hmm. ultimately responsible for, not spiritually responsible <laughs> for, mm -hmm. but you will get your raise if you do X, Y, and Z things well. Your job will be met. Your performance review is based on these things, managing these positions. That kind of clarity of structure how you report and relate to the board, that kind of clarity, which only comes from staff participation yeah, right. in the mm -hmm. search process. Mm -hmm. And I think at the core of the search, at the beginning of the search process, um, allows for a much more robust conversation during the interview process. So that's my big offering for what I would encourage a board is mm -hmm. to include staff mm -hmm. in a really thorough, honest assessment about where we are and because it's an opportunity to overcome the challenges that we may face, where do you imagine this organization in five to 10 years through this new artistic director's leadership or with this new artistic director's leadership? Those are the two questions I'm always, I've been asking in previous circles, not asking right now, Mosaic Jenner. Um, but those are the core questions that I've always been, and that came from experience doing searches. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the clarity of questions I need in order to know if this is a viable opportunity for me or for this board and staff? Yeah. And they're for this community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Hannah? You know, I think going back to your in initial question, I think that a board's work has to begin with a um a an assessment and recommitment to mission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. so yes. you have the mission that your organization began with, but I actually think that it's really important um at least once a decade for the board to take a very clear look at the mission and the reality of what the organization mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. doing, how it's achieving its mission. Mm -hmm. If the mission is still aspirational, if the mission is still central, if that's the direction the organization is going, you know, one of the questions I ask often, and this is a really good question, <laughs> and if you guys use it, make sure you credit me for it. <laughs> um, 
I ask boards when I'm interviewing, are you looking for evolution or revolution? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. are your goals mm -hmm. in this next moment yeah. for mm -hmm. the institution? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're looking for someone to radically shift the institution into a different trajectory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They've looked at the mission. They say, actually, we want to go here. We need a change agent, mm -hmm. right? And then other times they say, you know, we know where we're headed. We are, we have a good foundation. It's an evolutionary journey that we're on. We're not, we need to say, we need to stay close to who we've been as we evolve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's important for me as a leader to understand because that is going to frame how I do my work. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. If I walk into an organization, if I choose an organization, because one of the things that I think is really important, and, I, and this has been, a, a it shifted for me in my mind a decade ago, and I will never go back. When I go into an interview, I'm interviewing you as much as you're That's interviewing right. me. Mm -hmm. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm at a place in my life, I turn down 90% of the jobs that come my way, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm like, oh, right. I get to choose the reality that I'm going to spend my life in and how I'm going to do my life's work. And I want to know what I'm walking into. And I want to know what your goals are. Mm -hmm. So if it's a revolutionary moment, if you are looking for me to catapult this organization and I choose to take that on, then I'm going to frame up the way I do my work in a very specific way. If it's evolutionary, then I actually have to have a fundamental understanding of who the organization is, what people see in, as connected to the DNA of the organization. I have to love that. I have to breathe that. Mm -hmm. I have to have that lead me as the backbone for my work. And then I build around it and on top of it. Mm -hmm. right to evolve us so i want to know in the interview process whether or not the board is on the same page mm -hmm. because if half of the people are saying they want revolution and half of the people are saying they have they want evolution what i know is that there is no way to succeed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because 50 percent of the people will feel that you have failed them because you are not in alignment because the board is not in alignment mm -hmm. And so I, I think those are really important things for a board to take a look at when they're going into a search. And for anyone who's in the process, understand your own power and agency, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You are the person who will be left standing, holding the bag mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the decisions that other people make yeah. when you take on that job. Yep. So know what the job is, mm -hmm. not just what they say it is, to your point. But what it really is, and some of that is getting savvy about the questions you need to ask to understand what's underneath the first version. It's like, you know, the representative shows up. Mm -hmm. they, they they clean up nice. They put this organization <laughs> right. in a pretty dress and it's just gorgeous. And it's like, I'm in love. Mm -hmm. I want to know <laughs> what happens when the hair comes off and, the the top 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 and what's underneath that mm -hmm. do you and have emotional intelligence you know it's like <laughs> you know are you in touch with your things right you know, yes 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 am i bored after you know <laughs> <laughs> um so just knowing how to ask those questions i think it's really important to figure out who you are and why you're doing the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and letting that lead you and the way that you approach the questions you ask an organization yeah. mm -hmm. so it strikes me so a couple of threads i'm hearing a grounded understanding of where the organization is and that itself feels like a, a mountain to climb mm. right because I, I had a friend who went to a theater to interview and they said well we can't decide we don't know if we're a two and a half million dollar theater or one and a half million dollar theater and she said you're and a half million budget. Million. <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's evidence that will yes. tell you that answers that question you can aspire to be a two and a half That's million right. dollar theater but you are not a two and a half million dollar theater and That's it's right. sort of the same thing as like, we care about equity and inclusion. It's like, yeah, you know, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. a first challenge, it feels like, is for a governing board to have a grounded understanding of where they really are, which from my experience with boards is a hard thing to do mm -hmm. in the board. And mm -hmm. often, um, yeah, it's so hard. Get that yeah. hard. And then the other thing, I think it's going to come back in the support conversation is um, we know that people, well, there's a great theory that says people have two theories of action in their head at the same time. One is the espoused theory, the theory they would say out loud that mm. drives their action. Mm. And then there's the theory in use mm. that actually, if you looked at their behavior, I understand that you say that out loud, but you have this other one going and theory and use tends to be about, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't, you know, I don't want to look dumb. Uh, it tends to be more impulse. Um, and the challenge comes up when organizations, you know, genuinely believe they have a, a spouse theory that is true. Like we we want revolution, and then you start the revolution, mm -hmm. and they're like, mm -hmm. uh, "Hold on a sec, we didn't need that." <laughs> right. 
so a grounded understanding also and a real emotional intelligence of the board to say mm -hmm. you know we we think revolution but we we don't know what that feels like and we we're ready for it to feel really odd and uncomfortable mm -hmm. um or we're not ready so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm hearing a couple of threads in here around um how you can get ready for the work so uh I'm curious then about um, what would sort of be the next. So let's say an organization has a pretty good understanding of where they are. Um, and I think I think a follow-on question for me is, um, I would imagine what you want is really deep clarity, but also openness to what it might become mm -hmm. if you're entering as an artistic leader. So mm -hmm. super clear about who we are mm -hmm. and what we've been and what we tend to want and what we favor and what artistic practice looks like, but also a willingness to um be in conversation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i wonder whether i don't know if you have an, a, an opinion of this whether governing boards have an easier idea of thinking of executive leadership than artistic leadership or whether they mm -hmm. tend to come with the same artistic way. leadership is executive leadership. i mean i don't know yeah. i mean sorry sorry managing director mm -hmm. um as opposed to artistic mm -hmm. whether there is uh whether you've noticed an aptitude among boards or search committees for the the managerial side of the work, or whether that's just I'm making that up. <laughs> I mean, they're both they're both different opportunities. You. you know, <laughs> I, I think that I think where I frame that is there are different opportunities about where the organization is going, um, about the values and the issues and challenges moving forward. Um, I would I really say for the executive side. Often there are more clearly defined metrics, so to speak, for executive directors or managing directors. It's the idea of how much money have you raised? Um, have you worked at an organization where you've had to be responsible for earned revenue? And what did that look like? How many staff members reported to you? Um, you know, when have you had to make strategic choices for an institution? Uh, I think for an artistic director, um, What's interesting, actually, is that they they are more emotional searches. You know, they're, they're those things that they can't name. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that they say, and then there are things that are like, ah, but I, I can't name what I'm feeling. Um, and what you're trying, what I'm trying to get at usually in, in both searches, actually, for an executive director or an artistic director, are two questions usually I, I'm trying to get from a board. What is your fear? What, what, you know, there's there's a theory around like a lot of people operate out of some kind of fear that's underneath. So often I'm really just trying, and especially when when folks like Reg and Hannah show up, mm -hmm. then you really in the actual conversation of them inter interviewing hear, oh, what is your fear about this candidate mm -hmm. and what they would bring to the institution and what they would mean for that institution? Why is that a concern? Why are you expressing it in this way? Can I frame it to you as an opportunity? Can I frame it to you as a strength instead? You know, can I turn your perspective around? The other thing I'm asking myself often in both searches is, am I wrong for some reason? Did I get something wrong? And when you present a slate of candidates, it's a really great way to test those values, mm -hmm. to test that idea of, is what you're saying matching what you're doing? And when you actually have flesh and blood in front of you speaking to you, that is a real clear way to, for people to say, yes, this is why I enjoyed this candidate for X, Y, and Z reasons. The other thing that you have to do that's important for artistic director searches in particular is being on the same page about what is required, what can be learned, um, and, what, uh, and what can be developed out of a candidate. And that is often confusing. You know, they may want to hear out of Reg, for instance, well, we want, he didn't say anything about raising $2 million for a, a fundraising initiative. And I'm like, okay, why is that important to you? You know, and they say, well, it's important that they fundraise and, and our last artistic director fundraised that much. Okay, so is the number important? Is the fundraising important? Is the fact that Reg and Hana can build relationships important? What is important here about the kind of alternatives that we're presenting? Um, so it, it's really a moment for me where there's a level of clarity in seeing a number of different alternatives to that organizational direction and saying, how am I wrong? Am I wrong about the assumptions that I went in around an institution that's primarily done Shakespearean work um, and actually is very attracted to someone um, or very uh, interested in someone who is doing newer work? What does that mean for the institution? What might that mean for the art that's created? 
So that's some of the things in terms of how you frame those alternatives. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly asking myself as a, as a search consultant, what am I hearing from this group? What questions are they asking? Who are they reacting to? Um, am I wrong about some assumption that has been core in this search that a candidate is showing me? And perhaps I have to pull, push the search committee or the organization in a different direction. And I think you have to have, an, when you talk about openness and clarity, you have to have clarity about what the organization wants. But even I, as a search consultant, have to have a kind of jurisprudence to say, I actually might be wrong on this point. And I've got to explore that further in order to get the best and most optional decisions for the company. Yeah. So I'm curious about um, sort of the generation of alternatives, right? So how I'm curious about the skills, abilities, background, context that you think would help sort of define the kind of um, leaders that could step into an artistic director position. So um, I know it would show up in the job, sort of the spec, but I'm, I'm curious what skills and abilities or, or gifts. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's mm -hmm. such a loaded question. And I, I mean, I, I, I bristle-ish at the thought because I, I've been through probably six artistic director yeah. searchers prior to Mosaic or including Mosaic. And you have, I've answered far more questions about my administrative leadership mm. than my artistic leadership. And I do not think that's a fluke. Mm. I do think a big part of that is ageism. Mm. I think there is a clear mm. idea of how old leadership is mm. in addition to what race it looks like and what kind of pants or shoes it may wear. Mm. I think all of those mm. things are big factors, but I will never discount the fact that I was 29 and the runner up was really confusing Mm. too many boards mm -hmm. on paper and in person you have checked all our boxes mm -hmm. <laughs> you actually have been trained to be a unicorn mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. because we've mm -hmm. been trained mm -hmm. about, yes. we have been trained mm -hmm. to yes understand upstage downstage and all of the facets that go into making vibrant successful high quality artistic theater experiences and how to fundraise for them manage them, contract them, save the day, you know, all of the business skills actually are vital to the current definition of artistic director as I've experienced. And I think many boards mm -hmm. still imagine it to show up, which is that mm -hmm. the idea of, which I've always thought was a fallacy, but the artist who just reads plays all day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a complete fallacy. And you even said mm -hmm. right away, you are the chief fundraiser. You are the face of the organization. You are actually there for the lead marketing. Mm -hmm. asset of the organization mm -hmm. and so many of the conversations i'm having are actually search consultants pushing the board to talk more about art mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because so much of it's about business mm -hmm. and what we perceive leadership to be mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I just said to say i i wish mm -hmm. <laughs> on some days there were more conversations just about the quality of the art we all experience and why it moves us but I find the search should become unemotional quite quickly mm -hmm. and to become about nuts and bolts and ability to mm -hmm. get to metrics and definable successes. And discounting some some things that are really key. I'm like, have you ever ran a rehearsal room for a large musical? <laughs> Guess what? That's coaching and staff management. You know, you may not see it that way, you know, but that's actually a skill set that you're looking for. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because... Um, this again reflects an evolution in the field, right? So 30 years ago, um, artistic directors, it, it was not uncommon for someone who had been a freelance director who had not been in an institution to become an artistic director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, many, many, many of my colleagues who are great freelance directors who have been up in these searches <laughs> have, keep getting knocked out because mm -hmm. Many of our institutions have grown, you know, you start a theater and you, you start a like little love bubble to make art mm -hmm. and that love bubble to make art starting to become, it starts to grow up. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you've got buildings and you have a hundred staff members and you have very real responsibilities to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. Suddenly that love bubble becomes a business. And you get to a point where I think depending, and it all, again, it, some of it depends on what kind of institute size scale, because I'm, I'm running one of the largest institutions in the country right now. So it's a different game than where I was in St. Louis, which was a 10 to $12 million theater, right? Um, but th this idea is that once a theater starts to have so many responsibilities, boards get a little bit scared 
of having a leader who doesn't have the institutional um, experience, mm -hmm. right? Because like, well, we're too big for you to learn on the job. They forget the birth of the regional theater movement in that <laughs> framework. And likely the artistic director you're replacing. Right. Yes. Has likely been in that position. Well, this is, since. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is the other <laughs> challenge bubble. is that um, if you look at, to the UK, artistic directors tend to sit in those seats for about 10 years, every 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Sorry. It's it's a very common thing that you leave your institution and you go back to freelancing or you leave your institution, maybe you go to another institution. In this country, um, I, Molly Smith, the incomparable Molly Smith, who is a brilliant legacy leader of um, Arena Stage, was there for 25 years. The previous artistic directorship that I had was also replacing a legacy leader, not a founder, but a legacy leader like Molly. He sat in that seat for 33 years. Mm -hmm. So you have artistic directors who spend decades and decades and decades in those seats. So you're not seeing evolution in, in those leadership positions turning over very often. What that has meant for, for <laughs> I would say for my generation, it's a little older than Reg, but many of us set as number twos mm -hmm. in those seats for 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. rather than being able to ascend mm -hmm. into the executive leadership seat because the, the executive leaders held those positions for so long. But what that meant is that we were able to build out an incredible portfolio of institutional knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. um, which makes it very hard for some of my colleagues who are brilliant artists and actually great leaders, but don't have the institutional experience to be able to compete. The other thing that is a shift that you see in terms of artistic directorships is that you are now seeing, um, I think it was pretty rare in the past that you would have an artistic director who did not have a traditional artistic mm -hmm. practice, who was mm -hmm. not a director, mm -hmm. who was not a playwright. Yeah, right. right. Now you have the, uh, the birth of the artistic producer or the creative producer. Yep. This is someone who is deeply invested. They may come from a dramatur dramaturgical background. They're producers, but they don't have a classic practice. They're not the lead artists at the institution because they don't direct, they don't write, but they are the lead curator. Those skill sets are firmly about leadership, institutional experience, and relationships with artists. Mm -hmm. um, and it and and so you know I think we'll see what happens because this is really yeah. the last 10 years since we've seen mm -hmm. this. We'll see mm -hmm. how this works yeah. and whether, you know, and I have lots of friends. We have we have good friends <laughs> who are great, great <laughs> artistic <laughs> directors who are mm -hmm. are creative producers but don't have the kind of um, traditional practice. And so I, I think it'll be interesting to see what that means for our field when half of the artistic directors are not the lead artists and half of the artistic directors are, mm. and how that actually shapeshifts the regional theater. It's an exciting time of possibility, I would say. Yeah. Um, but this idea that, you know, you just have to be able to pick plays mm. was never true. Yeah, that's right. that's um, right. And is less true in 2023 than it has ever been. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I'm aware of the time and want to see if there's questions in the room. I certainly have another one. Um, but does anybody have a, a question burning in their soul at the moment or even just simmering a little bit? Yes. I'm curious about transition, which has not been such a long time for, for even one of you. You come in with at least a year of somebody else's vision and agenda. Mm -hmm. How does, I mean, mm -hmm. how do you step up as a visionary? How do you inherit that and then make it your own? Mm -hmm. Great. The question was around just so if people aren't hearing it online that uh, around the the transition of leadership. Often you well the pro the season you are in is usually programmed by the the leader behind you. I I actually am really grateful for the year because um it means that I just have to produce, which is the thing I can do with my eyes closed. <laughs> um, just make sure that she, that's what I've been doing my whole career, right? So my job is to make sure that Molly's vision is delivered with excellence to this community, and 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 to start to build relationships within my own institution, get to know my staff, get to know my board, get to know DC, and really start to build my first season to meet the community rather than coming into a community that I don't know and having to like, mm. you know, do a magic trick. I'd rather have the time. So I'm really grateful for the year of, of, um, of uh, producing my predecessors last season. To the question of transition, though, I will say that having 
witnessed transitions and then learned so much from my last transition as an artistic director, I was really clear with the search committee um, before I was hired that we needed to have a transition committee, we needed to have a transition plan, and that I would be actively involved in setting that transition plan to make sure um, that, and also I asked um, for a change management specialist mm. to come in and help um, support the board and the staff in understanding what this kind of generational change might be. Mm. Most of our institutions, change management is a science, mm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and the American theater has not practiced it. And so I, I felt that it was really important to level set expectations because my experience going into my last artistic directorship is that um, some people thought I would change the place, but no one thought that I would, that my presence and that my leadership would necessarily mean that we, we would change the way that we worked, mm -hmm. that some of those practices would shift. Yeah. Um, there was an expectation that I would fit into a sequel size <laughs> box. Mm -hmm. And there was not an understanding that I was coming in a fully realized human being with my own, <laughs> right? But only because they had been living in one way for 30 years. They didn't know, everyone who worked there had only worked under that leadership model. And so I thought it was really important going into an institution like Arena, which is, you know, one of our landmark theaters in the country, excellence is at its core, and also many people have worked there for 20 plus years. And so I wanted to make sure that we were all working with the same level of understanding that there was going to be change, there was gonna be evolution, that there would be moments where it got hard, but that we would come out of it with a shared vision for how we would move forward and um, to encourage people to embrace the, um, the uncertainty mm -hmm. as we start to build together. Um, and uh, the board was really receptive to that. And so we've, we've started that process. And I think it's really, really important for me working at this level to make sure that I had the uh, pillars of support I needed to be able to do my best work. And I learned through living what those things were. Um, I could not have walked into my first job and have known the things I know now about what I need in order to be the best artistic director I can be for an institution. Mm -hmm. How about you, Reg? Yeah, I would say, you know, the evolution revolution. I think Mosaic was, I think I could say I know, was interested in revolutionary evolution, <laughs> meaning <laughs> if there was a real desire to keep evolving, being kind of stay where Mosaic has been in terms of mission. There was no question of the mission. And in fact, um, my tenure start was timed with completing the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So one of the great gifts, which I really perked up about in the interview process was the board did not want to complete the final, you know, nuts and bolts of strategic plan or overall vision and language around it until an artistic director was in place, mm -hmm. which is a unique special opportunity to really level set where the next five to 10 years can go. And that there was excitement to do that with me was a big reason why I was ready to hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. um, but it also was a real clarity that we do not want to become arena stage in 10 years. Mm -hmm. We want to remain mm -hmm. mosaic. And I was quick to name that does include a budget size mm -hmm. because it did, it took some pressure off of it. We're not trying to go from 3 million to mm -hmm. eight mm -hmm. to 10 to 20. Then the actual, how we achieve the mission mm -hmm. as a team under my vision and leadership, which can at times feel revolutionary, mm -hmm. but still be contained in the box of evolution it actually meant the job, we didn't need to do radically new things, you know, it, or it, that wasn't the mandate. That was an opportunity. There was room to do radically new things. Um, and then the timing also, you know, I was producing uh, or leading or really observing the staff in action producing um, a season the staff picked, not a predecessor. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference mm -hmm. there. There's a difference mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of ownership mm -hmm. of that season um feelings <laughs> that are attached to the choices that have been made um and interestingly and I think I don't take for granted a real question of should that have been the choice we made mm -hmm. it really allowed a unique mm -hmm. power dynamic mm -hmm. of and I've gone through a search as a staff member who who had planned the season and a new artistic director came in and had to produce that season while I was still on staff and that was moments of tension 
for sure. Mm -hmm. But you have to explain choices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are seem quite minute and obvious and the way do it in our sleepness mm -hmm. to someone who's purposely trying to understand why you do that in your sleep and not this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was also very sensitive to that yeah. for the Mosaic staff I was meeting. Mm -hmm. I was perhaps too sensitive in some cases to their feelings <laughs> about their choices. Mm. But I knew so holistically what they were feeling. Yeah. Mm. And the ultimate thing was scare. Mm. Mm. Because we forget that these are actually jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're scared while going through a pandemic <laughs> mm -hmm. of will I even have a job? Mm -hmm. We all were scared of that yeah. during the pandemic. And you're yeah. doubly scared when the new person comes in. Mm -hmm who has been charged by the board to help us think differently. Mm -hmm. You may not be part of what thinking differently feels like. And so you're both protective and scared of the choices you made. So it's a really unique mm -hmm. opportunity to be in. Um, and I purposely chose observing for two reasons. One, it was, I was still working my previous job. There was too much overlap with the previous job and the new job in terms of administrative artistic leadership life, but also my directing life was one of the things that I always value, the search consultant really being obvious that, again, I don't think some boards understand you are often hired two years out. And so I do have commitments, mm -hmm. teaching, directing, mm -hmm. artistic relationships that I don't, I'm not willing to change. And they're actually an asset, an opportunity to chew this up. So all of those you know, unique things made for a um, six month of sponging while actively announcing and fundraising and programming the next season. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't really talk about November through February of 2022 <laughs> because it was one, I was part time, mm -hmm. which was not true. <laughs> and, not really. and, two, mm -hmm. and, and I was, and it's just, it was, it was a really hard personal three to four months. Um, you're building a plane while flying a while flying a plane while also helping this other organization who you care about and people there. You really care about your other staff members you're leaving. Get that plane as an order as you can while also going to be the lead generative artist in three other rehearsal rooms. That's a really tricky moment. Um, <laughs> lack of a better adjective. And so I was able to be honest about that to the staff and to the board and say, I'm going to observe and put my attention towards the future. Mm. And it was 90, 95% the right choice. There's 5% that we've now, you know, feel better about, but then it was really fun. So really quick, um, that I think the one thing with transition now that I've told a lot of boards and staff is that this is a longitudinal transition. Uh, this is a generational transition for mm -hmm. our field, like Hannah mm -hmm. said at the beginning. And so it's knowing, listen, this isn't a one-year thing. This isn't a two-year thing. This, this is really a five-year moment for our field. Um, and I think for boards and staff to understand that, um, to say, this is going to be a recovery. This is going to be a transition of its own. Uh, but don't think of it as, you got one season and that's it. You know, it's actually thinking, you know, it, it often takes three, four, five years mm -hmm. to even try to learn how to perfect this job. So it's telling boards, mm -hmm. listen, this is going to be a longer journey. And this is why I frame it as a journey. It's a longer journey than just a singular year. People think the search stops when the person signed the offer and you're like, y'all are both good. Okay, <laughs> great. You know, <laughs> you've done it. Um, it's saying, no, now nah, real work begins. And it takes even longer. And it's a harder, um, often climb, but it's a more joyous climb. And that's what you have to, that's what I feel I have to submit myself to, mm -hmm. is the joyous climb that is this moment in our field. It's this generational change. And it's about supporting leaders like Hana and mm -hmm. Reg and mm -hmm. others and saying, you all are going to lead our field in the next generation. How can I help? And that's the ultimate question. That seems a beautiful place to stop. Mm -hmm. So let's thank our guests for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everybody online. I hope you enjoyed our multimedia media thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And thank have you. a lovely thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all online.